So hello folks, thank you for joining us for another Cody Connects webinar. Today's topic is advocacy, changing laws, and political landscapes for gender equality. Our presenters today are Dr. Mamatha Achanti of India and Ms. Abidun Essien of Nigeria. They are both activists and advocates for equality and justice. So, Advocacy is a process by which each individual or group aims to influence decisions within the political, economic, and social systems and institutions. Advocacy for systems change should aim to improve respect for and to protect women's human rights. And indeed, it has proven to be an effective strategy to have women's voices heard through a series of actions that have resulted in changes in political landscapes and in new legislation to improve the lives of girls and women. Now, while systems advocacy works to improve the system to the benefit of individuals, a long-term approach to problem solving requires sustained effort. The kind of effort that is put in by these two activists in India and Nigeria. So in this webinar, Mamatha and Abidun will present their experiences in bringing about changes in legislation to stop equal marriage in India and to change the political landscape in Nigeria to be more gender equal. They will present an advocacy agenda that will bring about more inclusion of women in governance and raise awareness on the need to strengthen women's leadership. All right, so Mamatha is a women and children rights activist. She's a pro bono lawyer and founder of Taruni, a non-government organization working for the welfare of adolescent girls and women for more than 18 years. She co-founded the Network of International Legal Activists, or NILA, to help the non-residential Indian women who are facing marital and labor problems in other countries. Mamatha has conceptualized Verosa, an integrated support center to access justice for child abuse and rape victims without getting re-victimized through the legal process. So I invite uh, Mamatha to uh, begin her presentation. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I will be talking about uh, uh, my work and a little bit of my work and also the strategies of advocacy because those strategies I have used them. And also on child marriage because uh, uh, this issue in India, particularly in the state of Telangana. And his work in Telangana on child marriages and how the advocacy strategies worked, and also few on some small success story, and also the threats and challenges how I work. Threats and challenges. My work started way back in 2000 when I started this organization called Taruni. I have been working for the girl children because uh, nobody was working for the girl child and also we felt that uh, if we work children and their family um, will be de developed. So we started working for particularly for the adolescent girls 10 to 19 and I started my work in a rural background in uh, the district Varangal where um, there is a lot of uh, other uh, issues uh, like social events like child marriage trafficking, child abuse, gender discrimination, all of that. So I started working on uh, these issues. Initially, I started uh, talking to uh, these girls in studying in government schools. I found that the child marriages were rampant and I could see a small uh, child couples in the schools. Particularly, the girls were in the uh, uh, small uh, girls standards, boys were in 7th, uh, 8th standards. Then uh, I thought that we should start something for them, some forum, and we started the Balika Sanghas, the girl child clubs. And uh, these clubs um, helped uh, uh, mainly the, the girls to improve their skills and also their uh, um, uh, life skills particularly, and also other skilling, like we have done other skilling also. We still do, we could cover about more than 15,000 girls now. And also, as an advocate, I filed many uh, public interest litigations in various courts to help women and children to bring out new policies and legislations. 
we worked on child trafficking uh, we went to un to talk about it and also child labor to eradicate child labor in ginning mills the separating cotton from seeds and also conceptualize banarsa which is a support center for the abuse victims uh, with, uh, in collaboration with the telangana police uh, so i'll be talking about the main work which are done through advocacy that is stopping child marriage so when you will see uh, already wendy told us what is advocacy advocacy is a planned action directed at changing laws beliefs or attitudes and behaviors of people and duty bearers in the collaborative pursuit of social and economic justice advocacy can be done in many ways uh, there are many strategies but we can categorize them into basically six um, strategies like building the constituency of change and cooperation education persuasion litigation and confrontation strategies so first of all when you see this problem in child marriage in india there is almost uh, in some of the states it is more than 68% you can see here in the northern states in uh, of course in telugu state which is on uh, pradesh and now we also have a new state telangana you can see more than uh, uh, 20 to 30% in uh, telangana particularly that is 26.4% and 15 to 19 it is was 26.2% there is a high increase in boys uh, also because the uh, boys also getting married early actually the legal age of marriage is about 18 for uh, girls and about 21 for boys so uh, when i started this girl i met her in a school she was only 4 year old she got married and uh, she was uh, um, pressurized to marry because uh, uh, she is married to a elder person and they had given a, uh, them about 80000 rupees dowry and this girl uh, had to go to her villa space whenever there is a domestic work so she was given ice cream and made her to sit in the pandal for marriage so we worked uh, with her and our work started with monica uh, she is now studying well now she is still in college now so this our work started with her then uh, 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 we could see so many children like that we thought that we should work so to build the confidence and the constituency for change we had to work with the mothers first we created mothers committees that is mother for mothers and I explain to them what we can do for the girls for their girls for the girls to have some forums we had started balika sangas the girl child clubs uh, particularly in every village there will be two to three clubs where these girls will join every day they will uh, go to a center and uh, they'll share their uh, problems also learn so much and there is a library and some play material for them may we also train train them on life skills and uh, reproductive health etc so these through these clubs we help them to re, uh, realize that child marriage is a, a problem and also we uh, told them that uh, uh, how to co- overcome that so we also worked for the cooperation of the community we had to work with the caste and community leaders and the religious leaders which who are who play a major role in uh, finalizing fixing the marriage of a child and also performing it so we worked with them we had empty number of sensitization programs for them i also worked with the network with other ngos other non profits and uh, individuals so that uh, they, they can also uh, multiply or emulate what i am doing and uh, when you come to education strategies because this is the social evil and uh, attitudinal changes has to come we had to do lot of educational uh, programs like exhibitions for particularly for the children to know that child marriage is uh, uh, the implications of child marriage and also because the uh, the parents were uh, illiterate we had to um, tell them sensitize them through folk arts puppetry you know puppet shows all that and this helped a lot because uh, the uh, they like the uh, shows and they understood the implication so most of the marriages stopped because of uh, the sensitization programs so education through media also we have been we have been doing 
media actually the electronic media and the press has been very cooperative and they've been helping us particularly the they have carried an umpteen number of stories and also articles about child marriage what are the implications all this this also helped in a way in sensitizing the people girls also were trained by unicef in uh, filming the uh, pro their problems and we got uh, two awards in the international film festival um, where the girls uh, uh, produced films were screened so along with the education we were working on persuasion strategies this you can here see the uh, ex uh, cm chief minister where we had an opportunity of meeting him in the assembly along with other elected representatives we had given i had given you umpteen number of representations to the secretaries of various departments and even the ministers so that they understand the uh, gravity of the pro problem and they work uh, bring out some policies uh, in stopping and helping those children so even now we had conducted uh, many convergence meetings workshops seminars with the government officials and judiciary and also uh, with the ngos so that uh, uh, we could persuade them to bring out new laws particularly marriage registration law which helps in minimizing the child marriage and also child marriage uh, uh, related uh, policies so or uh, doing all this is not enough you know and always uh, julian used to say that along with the uh, strategies we should have some tactics so we could we also used many tactics particularly first one which helped us is the uh, working very closely with the police uh, because police have been uh, the key uh, people who used to counsel and stop the child marriage so we worked very closely with them that they helped us in uh, stopping child marriages and also we also uh, started fel felicitating the people who are uh, helping us in stopping these child marriages maybe the teachers the community members or the religious leaders we have initiated some awards for them every year we give it on uh, international girl child day we call them balika bandhu the supporters of girl child so definitely at the end after doing all this nothing has happened so i'll go, uh, just uh, go uh, go to another slide where we had done in 2005 a uh, filed the uh, case in national human rights commission uh, asking them to stop about 60 marriages which were going to happen and this was a major challenge for them because they never thought that such marriages are happening and uh, uh, they have asked the government to stop those marriages but only they could the government could stop only eight so we had again uh, filed an affidavit showing that these marriages happened and nothing has been done so the uh, national commission for women was put in and they had visited uh, our place and uh, uh, they had reported on this then the government had uh, realized that the age old law which was there in 1929 for the prohibition of child marriage uh, had to be amended then they had set up the parliamentary committee we were part of the parliamentary committee we could suggest and give some very good suggestions uh, to them uh, saying that uh, the child needs all the support even if she doesn't want the marriage you can make it void and also she can get maintenance from the groom or, or their family and also support for their uh, children all these recommendations were put in in the act and we were very happy in 2006 when the prohibition of child marriage act the new legislation had come after our struggle and uh, uh, that was a great weapon and we started filing uh, uh, all the uh, cases so i'll uh, slide back to my earlier slide where uh, i have shown i'm showing you that every year we had filed so many cases almost from 2006 when the act came we been filing because once a marriage happens then only we can file the case so we were filing about so many cases till now 56 only child marriage cases we we had filed and these child marriage cases you can see here they have been all have been acquitted that means no punishments but still if the case is on and when the case was done um it was not easy thing although it was very tiresome we had to attend courts we had to attend police you can see here a girl uh, has written a uh, uh, complaint 
evicting girl and uh, an affidavit has been signed by the parents you can see the affidavit also and if at all that still the marriage happens we will file a complaint in police station you can see the first investigation report of the police similarly if at all the, the marriage need to be stopped and the police are also not helping then we can go to court using this law and we can bring a decree to stop this child marriage so the all these things were uh, legally used and uh, we could stop uh, many marriages but uh, only because of uh, filing those cases and uh, filing on everybody because uh, the law says that anybody who uh, supports this marriage are punishable so even the prohet the church father or anybody who is helping or supporting the marriage has been have been in, implicated and in each case about 10 to 20 people were implicated that helped in stopping other marriages in that village that way we were uh, successful and uh, there were mass marriages also which happened on a special days in india so we also filed a case in uh, state human rights commission to stop those marriages if at all they are happening they have to verify the uh age of the child so that uh, uh, no child marriage happens but uh, after this law we are getting this law is not enough we have to get the state rules in uh, andhra pradesh when it was united so i had to fight for four years to get those rules the rules definitely helps because in implementation of the law and uh, we have to get uh, child marriage prohibition officers at all levels now after four years of uh, fight we got a jiva government order in 2010 uh, uh, at village level every level we have child marriage prohibition officers i need not go and sit for hours together stopping those marriages counseling them now i can send a message to this child prohibition officers who stop so now entire state we have people who are stopping child marriage so this this was our success and uh, when you see recently definitely confrontation strategy is the main strategy in advocacy although you may be blamed or branded but still using confrontation is always helpful so when uh, chief justice of uh, high court attended one of our workshop we made him uh, we confronted with him asking him to help the child marriage victims all those girls who were married already married and below 18 suffering because no government scheme uh, comes to rescue because of they are married early so we were, we have asked them for help uh, for in education in health and hygiene and uh, nutrition so now after uh, the chief justice has taken that representation as a public interest litigation now that uh, government has come up with a new scheme helping those child marriage victims uh, in all the ways so that was the recent success we got and uh, all these uh, strategies definitely helped in some of the cases i had to use all the strategies all the six strategies because it, it depends in uh, each case and in some of the cases like uh, emuna emuna is a bright girl when i met her she was in seventh standard or uh, she was getting married i had to stop her marriage we had stop the marriage using the help uh, taking the help of police and the government but later again when she came to 10th standard again her mother wanted to get her married so we had to use the court uh, litigation strategy and stop and of course in her village we had to do a lot of education programs sensitization programs building the constituency all that because no child marriage should happen in her village so uh, now the uh, lady is grown up she is uh, she has done her masters in pharmacy she is married to the same boy who waited for her all these years uh, the same alliance and uh, now you know, she has two daughters and she helps us in the campaigns she wants to become a civil servant uh, the civil services ias indian in she wants to join indian administrative service so that was one of the success story but anyway coming to the threats and challenges definitely this is a see one marriage stopping a marriage is uh, uh, very uh, nobody helps you or nobody supports you because they say that you can tell 100 lies but one marriage should happen according to indian saying 
but uh, there were many life threats even on our team members but uh, the community which uh, the building the constituency helped us communities always came to our rescue and supported us in the villages when we were stopping these child marriages and uh, second was uh, lack of finances definitely no one was uh, helping us with this work because this is against uh, the community everybody says poverty because of poverty they are getting married so but anyway uh, the most of the philanthropists some few projects we had from unicef charity homes netherlands and state government helped us but still we are looking for more finances fighting the cases is was a very tiresome and a complicated thing although i had to do my law for this and i did i graduated in law for this and uh, but uh, it's also disappointing because there are no convictions but um, what stop many child marriages as i told uh, in the villages changing the law also has been very useful now we uh, people are uh, definitely realizing because the penalties penalties increased it from 15 days of imprisonment to now 2 years of imprisonment and 1 lakh penalty so that also deters people in uh, to in getting their children married and also confrontation strategies made us uh, alienated from the group and branded us as the rebels or the activists and even the donor circles also government or in government also they think like that but at the end after 19 years of work we are looked at as resourceful a resource agencies and we are technical and the knowledge partners to many a government departments so definitely many sacrifices but uh, gave us very little recognition all the few awards but best rewards the girls who were whose marriages were stopped now very successful in their careers we have a charity accountant we have a medical uh, student who has just completed her medicine engineers we have um, pharmacists we have different uh, in different fields that gives us lot of satisfaction so coming back to advocacy you have seen in my work that i have used all types of strategies of advocacy and uh, definitely particularly in changing the belief system attitudes and also uh, making the uh, bringing the uh, issue to the focus of the government or the elected representatives all the strategies have to be used in uh, advocacy and that is very important then only we will succeed so this is about uh, my presentation uh, people did you have to save the girls and stop this child marriage which are still happening in most of the countries Thank you so much, Kodi, for giving me this opportunity, and also for Julian and Wendy and Robin helping me uh, in with this. Uh, and uh, sorry if I have been very uh, troublesome, uh, maybe making you do this. Thanks a lot. <laughs> No trouble at all. It's wonderful to be able to uh, hear the results of your efforts. Um, what we're going to do now is have is open up the uh, conversation to the room for the next uh, five minutes or so. And uh, if you have any questions or comments uh, for Mamatha on her work, uh, you can use the chat, which is uh, down at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. If you don't see the chat bubble, click on the purple triangles and it will pop up. So while people are thinking, I do have a question for you, Mamatha. What are the, um, what are the current rates of child marriage in India at the moment? Current rate? It is almost 30% to... 30% of child marriages happening in southern India and the northern India we have about 50 to 60% uh, still child marriages are happening. Wow. So it's still a big problem in India. And also we have another issue of children themselves eloping and getting married very early before 18. So that is also another issue we are facing now. We are trying to address that because children are in a hurry and it's consensual. So uh, it also attracts other uh, uh, laws like uh, protection of children from sexual offenses act. 
and the boy is arrested in such cases so that is another uh, problem we are facing in india mm -hmm. i have two questions i'm going to go with julian's first mm -hmm. Um, advocacy is known for being difficult to evaluate. How have you approached evaluation? Uh, we've been doing a lot of evaluation uh, 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 for every, every time whenever we use a strategy. So particularly in advocacy, sometimes some work, some don't. And sometimes we have to use all different strategies, then only it works. And at the end it may not work also. You know, advocacy is uh, like pain. And lobbying, advocacy, all this have to go for a long period of time. That's why I can say that 19 years of uh, our work on child marriage definitely help, are showing fruits now. And uh, we've been evaluating through uh, interns, volunteers. Every time, whenever we start an initiative or a take up a strategy or a tactic, we try to evaluate that. For example, I'll tell you, we've been using the puppet puppet shows in villages as cultural programs to educate people. So after some time we had done an evaluation and we found that most of the parents still remember those shows after six months. So the recollecting value definitely helped and some of the parents told us that because we saw that the, those shows in our village and the, the talks happened, the shows happened and that's why we have postponed our child's marriage. So definitely those tactics and uh, these strategies always we have to evaluate and see whether it is working or not then only do it. Thanks Julian. Thank you. I, yeah, I can see Biham. Do you believe yeah. that child marriages will continue because of this skewed girl child ratio in India? Yeah, that's also enough. another issue which Darni works on. We work on infanticide and feticide, improving the girl-child sex ratios. In particularly in uh, some of the parts in northern India, in uh, Punjab, Haryana, all those places where girl-child uh, sex ratios, that is thousand boys compared to girls uh, and the number of girls, it is always very low. If there are thousand boys, there are there may be only seven hundred girls. So most of the boys are not, the grooms are not getting girls to marry. So there, that's why even there is a risk that the child marriages also increase. But uh, I think that that's why for a girl child, we have to work from her from the womb till she grows up, uh, up to 18. Then only these things may help. Thank you, Nihal, for asking that question. So I can see Lakshmi, you are doing wonderful work. Thanks a lot, Lakshmi. We have many laws, but enforcement is pretty weak. What needs to be done to improve conviction? Definitely, the other, we need to fast track courts because most of the cases when they go to court, uh, uh, reaching the court and for discussion in the court, it takes almost one a year to two years. So by that time, if the child is married, then if the uh, marriage is consummated, she may have the uh, kids also. So uh, then the judge will say that she's already uh, happy in the marriage. Why do you want to convict the uh, groom and all? So most of the cases, that's why I go for acquittal. And also there is uh, always a compromise outside the court which are happening. To overcome all this, they should be, everything should be done within three months. Uh, actually, in the act also we have to amend and stipulate as done in the Protection of Child Sexual Abuse uh, Offences Act. So, uh, similarly, we have to bring in fast track courts, separate courts for the child related uh, uh, crimes and issues. Then I think uh, we can speed up and convictions definitely we have to court where we will see for the evidence and uh, witnesses. So, we have to provide all that and police have to concentrate on these things so that every case gets conviction. Thank you Lakshmi for asking that.
So, our next presenter is Abidun Isiet. She is the Executive Director of Abidun Isiet Initiative for Girls, which is an organization committed to promoting safe spaces for girls and women in society. Abidun is also the National Director on Women, Gender and Development Affairs of the African Youth for Development Commission in Nigeria, and she's a resource consultant for the European Centre for Electoral Support in Nigeria. As, excuse me, as a young female politician and a member of the ruling party in Nigeria, Ebedun is a gender activist, a women leadership fellow of the Cody International Institute and a community development expert and, chain, and agent for social change. And also Mamatha is one of our women leadership fellows as well. So we're very excited to see the results of their fellowship. So Abby, I'll leave it to you now. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's a project of some you know, members of the All Progressive Congress of Nigeria, which is the ruling party in Nigeria, committed to changing the narrative on, on women's participation in governance. So the background, there's a, sorry, there's a global concern on the statistics of women in politics. Six national elections have been held in Nigeria since 1999, when the when the country turned returned to democratic governance after years of military rule. But only a handful a handful of women have ever held public offices. Just about three percent of of people elected to public offices in 2020 in 2003 were women by 2007 the figure that figure increased to seven percent in 2015 the number declined to 56 to 5.6 percent the current statistics now is 6.4 percent you know knowing fully well that over 6,000 women aspired for political position in this 2019 election and just 2,970 of them were candidates while 62 of them were ended up getting elected and the, they are majorly from the ruling party and the main opposition party of Nigeria. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, the average of women political participation in Nigeria has remained 6.7% in elective and appointed position, which is far below the average of 22.5%. Concerted efforts have been made by government and non-governmental organizations to increase the level of participation of women in politics, in line with the declaration made on the Fourth World Congress, Women in Beijing, 1995 which advocated for 30 percent affirmative action but no effort made by political parties and also in addition to that political parties have not even domesticated some of the national laws we have for instance we have the national gender policy which was passed into law 2007 which made provision for 35 percent of women in decision making plan and also the two major ruling parties in nigeria have a provision for 35 percent of women in occupying some of the structures within the party structure but they are not following through on that the goal of project equity is to increase the number of women in elected and appointed positions in nigeria objectives is to prepare women within the party structure for leadership there's a general mindset about what a woman is expected to have or who a woman should be and you know women are no they don't really you don't see them on the forefront of um, the structure or taking taking positions in the political party they are only known to take women leadership position or women mobilization which for us is not enough to really change the narrative for women's representation in politics so because most of this uh, mindset is due to some cultural or religious norms of women in politics they don't see themselves occupying some leadership position but they can see themselves representing like a representative of women in different political position another objective for us is to sustain women within the party structure 
it's uh, it's a way of making women grow within the party structure how can they grow from being just a woman leader to be secretary of political parties in the world level up to the state level or to a national level the sustenance also talks about making them also relevant and consistent in their political ambition and one other objective is to advocate for the review of the party constitution with the focus of mainstreaming gender in the constitution so that we want to bring to life some of the national and international policies that have been into law on 35 percent affirmative action for political parties to move beyond just mentioning a few of it in their constitution but also domesticating moving a, a, a step further in domesticating it at the different level of the political constituency from the world level to the local governments to the state level and also to the federal level Another thing for us is to support key stakeholders or rangers to increase representation of women in decision making in making platform. Another one is to lobby for appointment for women within the party structure, which is one of the main backbone of this project, is to get as, at least more women appointed into party. We in Nigeria, we really focused on getting women elected into different positions, leaving behind the appointed position. Now we're moving forward in advocating for one, more women to be appointed into different positions. And you know, we have a testimony and outcome for that as my appointment came as a special advisor to my chairman of my local government council. As a, as a special advisor on ICT, civil society and global partners. So another objective for us is to promote the awareness among stakeholders and women on the campaign for increased representation of women in decision making in Nigeria. We also hope to prepare an Emily's list, a list of women who deserve to govern within the party and outside the party. A lot of women have really done well in the party structure and outside the party in their own fields or areas of expertise. And we believe they should be recognized by being given an appointed position or bringing them into the party to run for an elected position. So the rationale for a strong case group within the political party structure. The political parties are the major vehicles for the expression of essential futures of democracy because we believe the political parties bring about to life some of the values of democratic processes. Women, women have not been received due to concentration of record or recognition in political parties, internal democracy, thereby limiting and injuring their effective participation in political parties. You know, the internal party democracies covers organizing a free fair election, regular elections or internal internal election, electing candidates for representation for political parties. It's also the internal party democracy also involves equal and open participation of all members. And in this process, women are not really doing well in the, in the internal party democracy. They have been sidelined in most of these processes. So research has also shown us that few women are able to sustain themselves Political in political structures, and women occupy less than 10% of position within the party. Like I said earlier, most of the women position in the political parties are just the position of a woman mobilizer or a woman leader. How do you find a woman becoming the chairman of a political party, even at the world level? So women see themselves just occupying this position, and this, from the research, have shown that it's not enough to really bring about change in the representation of women in leadership. So further ahead on our rationale, there are many advocacy groups outside the political parties for women, but no advocacy group within the political parties. We found out that we have so many groups in civil society, the government, different commission advocating for women. But you know, we do we have little or no advocacy groups like that within the party structure, especially the ruling party and the opposition party. So there's a need for us to have an advocacy structure of a group of people who understand the need for inclusion of women in leadership position 
within the party structure. One, because it's better because they understand the system within the party they are, and the party structure and they understand how the party works. Another rationale is for a strong advocacy group by women within the party, political parties will promote women empowerment within the political parties. Because when women push for something within themselves, the other women are encouraged and also empowered in the process. An advocacy group by women within the political party, like I said, can be sustained because it's been driven by women. They've taken ownership of the advocacy. So some of the advocacy tools and tactics that we're using, first is lobbying. Lobbying for appointment for women at different levels of governance, from the local governance level to the state level and also to the national level. Because we found that, that as women occupy this position at this level, they tend to grow in it and also master the politics process or the level of governance at those levels, and they can be involved in other better position. Also sensitizing sensitization of women in politics, for women in politics to understand the need of more women and also the need for supporting women who are going for an elective position. Persuasion also at the party level, persuading the party leaders and the stakeholders within the party to support our mandate for including women in governance. Another tool that or tactics that we use is negotiation. We negotiate for for women to be given appointment based on different areas. It can be from a um, geopolitical zone. It can be from the level of expertise. We bring in forward different areas that we can think we believe that we will use. We can use to negotiate for more seats for women in political parties. And also for another tactics is the mentorship and training for women in politics. I think that's one major important area for us there, training women at different levels to understand leadership, governance, so that they can also participate well in governance. So next is uh, the project equity and the outcomes and impact. Our uh, outcome is to increase the percentage of women appointed into various offices at the three levels of governance, like I said, the local, the state, and the federal level, to increase participation of the percentage of women becoming candidates or parties at the subsequent election starting from the year 2023. They were open to have a constitutional amendment and also to improve participation of women in politics. There's a video I would like us to watch. It's a, it's a call to action by some of the women leaders within Nigeria who are occupying different positions and the political parties. So women doesn't... have been discriminated against either in participation of election of political leaders or emerging as political leaders. It's shameful, it is sad. I just think the system does not favor the women folks. Allow women to, to participate. Allow, they will never allow us to participate. So we need to fight for it. We have to appeal to the men's conscience. But we need to stand up to bullies. Women need to stand up. When you lift a woman up, you are lifting a nation up. But if you suppress a woman, you are suppressing a nation. We are not fighting the men. We are not instructing the men. We are here to be partners in progress. President Buhari has promised us that uh, he will work with women. And I want to believe he's going to do something better for the women this time around. I believe Mr. President will break the jinx this time. When he breaks the jinx, he will set the tone for others that will come after him. We want more women participating. That, uh, women's inclusion in governance helps to advance a vibrant democracy and also to address gender equality in governance and also reflect a good policy making and also to build an overall strong nation. I believe it's a win-win approach that, you know, 45 or half of the population cannot be left out of development in the nation. And that's why we believe project equity will give us that. So I think we're open to questions and comments. Perfect. And as you were talking, uh, Nihal uh, Kovali had asked, is it easier for women whose family members, husbands, fathers, brothers, who are already in political parties, able to sustain themselves for long periods of time as authority figures within the political parties? 
Yeah, we've seen more of that in Nigeria when, you know, parents of, you know, women become godfathers or the mafia in the politics. And with that, they were able to sustain themselves or get themselves into leadership position. Really, most of the women we have in the Senate is either they have their husband who is a godfather in the political party, or their husband has been an ex-governor or ex-senator in, in the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So it has been like that, and it's a way of even sustaining women and men in politics. I have a question as well. Like, as you were doing your project equity uh, work, what were the what were your biggest lessons learned throughout the project? Okay, I think you know it's uh, about understanding the whole advocacy within the party structure. The advocacy we use within a party structure is different from what we use in an NGO world or civil society world. You know, there you understand what the men want. Sometimes they ask you, you know, they tell you the type of women they want to see on the table. They tell you some of the challenges they have with women in leadership, and it gives us more opportunity to learn from them and also use some of what we've learned from them to use in our advocacy work or projects. So it's a lesson process for us, and also it gives us the room to know what the best practices within the political parties, and also to know how we tackle advocacy within the parties as a party person. Julian has a question for you both. Um, you are both engaged in a research fellowship along with your advocacy. How has research supported your advocacy or vice versa? Any lessons on communicating research for influencing purposes? So I'll get you to respond first, Abby, and then we'll have Mamatha. Okay, thank you very much. You know, while doing our research on this project, we realized that, you know, we don't really have statistics of women appointed into different positions at even state and federal level. So it shows, you know, the gap that we have. A lot of the advocacy we have, we have seen in Nigeria focus majorly on women elected into different positions. So there's a gap on, we don't have the baseline statistics for how many women were appointed at different, you know, levels of governance or different administration in, the, in Nigeria and at different levels of governance. So it shows the gap the wide gap we have in the statistics and which gave us the opportunity to really provide you know, feedback and also for our evaluation and monitoring in the sense that we're able to now go back and do a research and survey to get actually what is the baseline statistics of women appointed into, into various positions from local level to state level and to the federal level. Thank you. Mamatha, what are your experiences with research? Yeah. I've been uh, using the research a lot because uh, child marriage, uh, we had uh, uh, interns, international interns doing uh, research on uh, our work and documenting it. This was supported by UNICEF and uh, they said that Balika Sanghas, all these girl child clubs and uh, supporting them for uh, girls for education and uh, the advocacies we have done. By, uh, the advocacy and lobbying done by Karuni resulted uh, in most of the marriages, child marriages stopping and also girls uh, educate. There is a lot of uh, improvement in the education levels of the girls. But uh, at our level, we've been taking up this research and we usually utilize the services of uh, volunteers and interns in doing, taking up this research. Because uh, now we see every time there are many changes happening in the, uh, in the communities. Particularly uh, when I started the work, it was only the caste and custom was the reason for child marriage. Now you see that it is the family's respect and also a girl child looked, up, uh, at, uh, looked at as a burden because of the dowry and the money we take, uh, they have to shell for the marriage. So this kind of changes have been documented very well. Every time we take up a proper scientific and academic research, and that has helped us. Many universities, uh, law colleges, and they had sent their interns and they had done uh, their research on this and submitted papers. So we are learning uh, from uh, our work, 
and improve, trying to improve ourselves. So that's it, Julian. We have a question on the another question on the floor for Abby. Um, it's uh, Laxmi said it's a really long way for women to reach heights in politics, but if they are united, they can make it. Is anything being done in this front in Nigeria? Okay, thank you very much. You know, getting women united in Nigeria has been a major issue because, you know, we have different political parties, you know, and, you know, getting them united as a political body has been a very difficult issue because you have interests. And, you know, most of the coalition we have now is being led by civil society organization. And the gap I've seen that is that most of the civil society organizations don't understand some of the issues we have within the party structure. So most of the poor advocacy don't end up becoming and bring better results that we are expecting. So getting women coalitioned or getting women having one voice united within Nigeria has been a major issue. We've seen different factions of women doing similar things. So for us, we are in the All Progressive Congress. And because you know we already have an uh, interest, so it's difficult for us supporting another another political parties that have the same person that is vying for the same position. So it's been an issue like that. And also as a someone in the ruling party, if you're found supporting another woman in another party, you it's you are time to be doing an anti-party. So it can affect your political growth and development. So mm. it's been a major issue because of interest of women. You know, there's a woman called Obie Ezekwese. She came out to run for presidency. As a later on, few weeks for the election, she stepped down. And I think one of these major issues was some of these reasons that I've highlighted earlier for women coming out to support their candidates and coming out all from that, yes, we need a woman that will become the president of Nigeria. She has been leading the Bring Back Our Girls movement in Nigeria, and she's doing successfully well but she couldn't sustain our political ambition. So as we're winding up, I would like to thank you for uh, participating in our Cody Connects webinar. Uh, Mamatha and Abby have presented some very different um, ways to actually embed advocacy work within the within the work that they're doing within their countries and have had some very successful re, some very successful results and also challenges and you know that's one of the reasons why we like to do our webinars is to is to engage other um, other participants and to have some ideas and to also connect folks with each other um, so I would like to thank uh, Mamatha and Abby for the work that they've done to uh, and taken away from their work day uh, to uh, to join with us. One of the things we do ask you is that you um, spend about a minute to evaluate today's webinar because we always like to um, we always like to get some feedback on what's working for our audience and also to perhaps collect some suggestions of the types of webinars that Cody graduates can do along with us. So without so you'll notice in the chat that there is a link that will take you to the anonymous survey. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Um, I look forward to another Cody Connects webinar. If you're a Cody graduate, please log in to Cody Connects and join the the uh, circle of over of thousands of Cody graduates who are continuing their work all over the globe. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. And thank you.